there would be large chunks that would flake off of my scalp about the size of a dime or maybe a penny. And it would just get stuck in my hair. So it was pretty gross. And I would just have to peel this giant flake of skin out of my hair. When I was younger, I never had a problem with my weight. So I was getting away with it, if you would. Lo and behold, I wasn't getting away with it. I was just kind of stacking up all of the bad stuff inside of me until one day it just kind of overflowed my inflammation bucket. Part of my family, they thought I was crazy. They thought I was going to kill myself. Oh my gosh, you have to have your fiber. You need your vitamin C and your cholesterol is going to be through the roof and you're going to die by the time you're 40. All right, welcome. Good morning. I have with us today, Wayne, who is going to share his success story. Wayne, how are you today, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for nice being be here. here. Where, tell us, I guess we'll just start with your background. Tell us a little about yourself. Sure. I'm uh, 39 years old. I live in Central Florida. Software engineer by trade. Been doing that about 13 years. Just trying to solve problems, figure things out. And that kind of translated over to my health. And I had a MS diagnosis come up last year. So for the longest time, I had a whole lot of autoimmune type stuff that was going on and little things here and there. I had psoriasis, real bad dandruff, aches and pains, diarrhea, whole nine yards. And it wasn't until that MS diagnosis that I started to jump in gear and really go all in on my health. I had been experimenting with a keto diet and carnivore diet for about the last eight or nine years. Had some really good success with that. And from there, it just snowballed into eventually finding a carnivore diet. I tried that for a while. It worked a little bit, then I fell off. I always had super bad cravings. And so I've been just on a journey of how to find those cravings and just knock them out so that I don't have those. And I've been pretty successful so far with that now. And since I've been able to do that, it's just really helped with all of my symptoms. Everything's just uh, been getting better. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about some of those symptoms uh, in the coming minutes. And I do know that the one thing that I'm still working on is my migraine headaches. I'm still battling those, but I'm sure that it's going to uh, take a little while for me to uh, finish getting those worked out. Okay. Gosh, there's a few things going on there. So 39, you said you've been battling sort of autoimmune type symptoms for a number of years. You mentioned psoriasis, which is considered an autoimmune condition. And you've been keto, low carb, carnivore-ish back and off and on for about eight or nine years is what you're saying. Tell, when did you first notice the autoimmune type things, the psoriasis, I guess the psoriasis would be the most obvious one. And how was that treated initially either by you or a physician? And how has that gone for you? So the, the psoriasis and I guess more specifically dermatitis on my scalp, that started back in about 2003. Actually, a lot of my symptoms started back in about 2003. That's I graduated high school that year. And that was flaky scalp dandruff, but there would be large chunks that would be that would flake off of my scalp about the size of a dime or maybe a penny. And it would just get stuck in my hair. So it was pretty gross. And I would just have to peel this giant flake of skin off out of my hair. And that flared up. And over the years that has came and gone, I can I figured out that I can control that just by avoiding some I was eating a lot of non-fermented dairy, a lot of cheese, a lot of fake cheeses, if you will, a lot of milk. And I always had a little bit of issue with that. And over the years, I figured out that if I stayed away from that stuff, I felt better and the psoriasis and stuff would clear up. It's, at, it's about on a two-week delay. So if I eat a bunch of that, it doesn't really agree with me. That's one of the things that I've had a little bit better luck with lately now as I've healed some of my gut issues and, and whatnot like that. Interesting that you say that you can have food and you don't, it doesn't show up for two weeks on you, which is, that makes it really hard to figure it out because most people aren't thinking what I ate two weeks ago was a it, problem. And that's one of, the, does, one of the interesting things. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly on a two, when I say two weeks, it's like, I can almost write it down and in 14 days notice that it's completely cleared up, completely gone. And then if I start eating lots of uh, non fermented uh, cheeses, uh, dairy, things like that, a lot of milk, it'll come right back, but it will take about two weeks. And it's not that it's not there. And then the next day, it's all the way there. It's that it's not there. And then I can feel my scalp get soft, and then it will start flaking a little bit. And then after about two weeks, I can just shake my head and there's a snowstorm falling out of my hair. 
and it never ends. And you can vacuum vacuum cleaner my head. My wife's done that before, before we go out, she'll just vacuum cleaner it for 10 minutes. And I'll think that I'm going to get away wearing a dark colored shirt. And that never worked in the past. But now it's, it is, as long as I keep it controlled, it's, I can do that just through not, not only eating the meat, and I eat the fermented vegetables and the fermented dairy products as well. And I don't have a problem with the fermented versions of those. So I feel like eventually I'll be able to get back to that if I wanted to. But for right now, it's it works pretty good just doing the the fermented stuff. There's something going on there with my gut that I'm trying to figure it out. And I think it's related with that. Okay. And so 2003, so almost 20, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, like 20 years ago, it's 2023, that all this start, started happening. Your diet as a kid was standard the standard diet was there any specific thing you had done back then it was i would say it was pretty standard my parents they cooked m- most of the time we didn't go out to eat a lot but right around that time if you probably remember but crisco became popular so i was eating crisco a lot there was always whatever whatever we were having fried chicken it'd be cooked in crisco fried f- fish cooked in crisco always margarine always all of the vegetable oil junk and then when I grew up, we moved right around 1994. And then I started eating kind of the same stuff. We got into eating like the boxed stuff because we had a grocery store right across the street from us. So frozen pizzas, hot pockets, things like that. Started eating those. And then when I graduated college, I had this revelation that all of a sudden I was free and I could go eat anything I wanted. I started to hit up all of the fast food joints and I'd eat all of fast food three days or three times a day. And then there was always all kinds of microwave, whatever I'd eat. It comes with four little sandwiches in it. No, I'd, I'd microwave and eat the whole box. And when I was younger, I never had a problem with my weight. So I was pretty much, I was getting away with it. If you would, lo and behold, I wasn't getting away with it. I was just stacking up all of the bad stuff inside of me until one day it just overflowed my inflammation bucket. And led to figuring out, okay, what do I got to do to reverse this? And luckily so far, I think that everything that I've done, as far as the damage that I've incurred, I think that it's, I think it's reversible. So that's the journey that I'm on now is learning everything I can about it to figure out how to just make it go away as close to make it like it's never happened, if you will, as possible. The Chris goes, I, I remember somebody telling me like a lot of these grocery stores, when they make cakes for their frosting, a lot of times they'll just whip up Crisco and powdered sugar. And that's how I make the frosting, which is, you, know, you think about, and I, I, I know I, I, over the years, I know I've eaten some of those cakes. I'm like, my gosh, how awful must have that been? When you were kids, you, you said you got out of the house, you just fast food all the time. Did you learn how to cook as a kid? Did you have any, were you like taught how to cook and prepare your own meals or was that not really I, something you learned? Yeah. So I was, I, at the time, even when I was younger, I always cooked with my mom. She taught me how to cook. So we would still cook stuff. I think one of the biggest issues is we just didn't know at the time that it's not necessarily like what you cook, it's how you cook it. And everything would have margarine and and Crisco in it. There was always a lot of sugar, a lot of uh, baked goods. So we didn't eat out at restaurants in the 90s so much as it was we were just uh, essentially cooking the most inexpensive things in the grocery store. That once I went into college, I didn't really do any cooking, but I did eat, I I was eating out constantly. And then after college, I started cooking again every day. And I still do that now. And, but I was still cooking. We would make everything. We'd make macaroni and cheese casserole, things like that, that we thought were relatively healthy just because we didn't know. I didn't know that. And that's where it ended up, but I would make all kinds of home cooked dishes and assumed that it, the fact that it was home cooked meant that it was healthier than eating out. And since then, I've just completely adjusted that. I still, I, I make all of my meals here at the house, but as you now, they're, it's pretty much just all meat for me. It's either steak or it's ground beef. And that's basically all that I eat. So I still get to cook. It's just, I don't know if you want to say less boring, but it's or more boring, but it's, it's just meat on the grill every day. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I do similar. <laughs> Let me ask you about this MS diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So you said you recently were diagnosed with MS multiple sclerosis, which autoimmune disease affects nervous system. Can be there's several different subtypes, but it can be life ending, life threatening, debilitating, on and on. How did that manifest itself? And how tell us about the diagnosis. Sure. So it actually started back in 2016. I had a, a case of optic neuritis in my left eye. And uh, essentially, it just 
it looked like somebody had taken little pieces of like scotch tape, the, the translucent tape that's blurry and just put a bunch of little pieces all over my, my glasses. I, I wore glasses at the time. And th- that to me was a little bit alarming. And the fact that the, that I had a, a double vision. So if I would kick a rock, I would see the rock go in my right eye and a quarter second later, I'd see the same image of the rock taken across the ground in my left eye. And that was really weird. I went to the hospital. They hooked me up. They gave me IV treatment for steroids to lower the inflammation for that. They did brain scans, didn't find anything MS related. They told me they didn't know what it was and sent me home. And I went home and just continued on trying to be as healthy as possible. And then last year, at the end of 2022, in November, my lower body from my over about the course of a week or two, from my belly button all the way to my toes, it started in my left leg that just went completely numb. It was all tingly, similar to like when you sit down funny, maybe on the toilet, and then you stand up and your leg or your foot's just numb and it feels funny to walk. That's how my whole lower body felt for a good week or so. So I went to the doctor. Uh, they didn't. They asked me about my history. I told them about the optic neuritis because that's uh, in in a lot of cases that's one of the first triggers, if you will. And then they sent me to a neurologist. We did some MRIs. Then they found spots on my brain and my spinal cord. And then a handful of neurologists and a handful more of MRI scans, and they determined that I had MS. The by that time when I got that diagnosis, I, I had already done a bunch of autoimmune related uh, research of my own, just diet nutrition, because I was already well underway to trying to fix all my other problems. Because I knew I had some other problems and I'd been working on fixing those already. When they told me MS, it's I just shifted gear right into to researching that. And, and it turns out everything that I was learning already, I, I was able to apply to that and build this model of what I think is going on wrong with me. So now I'm working with my neurologist and I, I got a couple other doctors that are helping me treat inflammation. And it's all based around meat-based diet, carnivore diet. And then I do have a little bit of the fermented vegetables as well. When you initially, so back in, you said, I think you said 2016, when you developed the optic neuritis, and then obviously subsequently in 2022, when you were diagnosed with EMS, your diet at that time was a low carb diet, correct? Or something, or what were you doing at that? It was, it, I would have called it at that time in 2016, it was just barely getting into a low carb diet. I had just learned one of my best friends told me about keto and I had, I had never heard of it. He told me what it was and he told me that his wife had lost some weight and I wasn't really looking for weight loss. I haven't, I've never been really overweight or very overweight, I would say. But I found out about keto, so I started researching that. And then for right around that time is when, is when I had optic neuritis. I don't know what you call it, but it, it was almost perfect timing to, to have that and then continue on that. And then over the years, that keto, that original keto diet that I did, it was, I tracked it every day. Uh, I measured ketones every day. I, I logged my food meticulously, made sure I was doing 20 grams of total carbohydrates or less every single day. I was measuring out my cup and a half of broccoli and splitting that between three meals type thing, adding butter or olive oil on top of chicken or beef or whatever I was eating. The keto diet that I was on, it, I was doing really good with that. I, that improved a lot of my brain fog and fatigue symptoms, but not near as much as I've had improvement lately. So after I did keto, I was, I've been low carb since 2016, some form or another, but then I fell into the, the pipeline, if you will, of the dirty keto, all of the keto snacks, the keto chocolate chip ice creams, the keto cookie bricks, all the, the whole nine yards. And I stopped paying attention to my ingredients quality and started more just trying to make sure that I was getting enough fat. So I went back to eating lots of uh, keto treats, if you will. And it, when you check the ingredients labels on some of those, at least some of the ones that I were eating, they're laden with vegetable oil, whether it be soybean oil or canola oil, whatever oil. So they, even though it said keto, it n- knowing what I know now, it, I would not consider that healthy whatsoever. So that kind of morphed in going full ketogenic for years but having low quality keto ingredients, some that you could consider toxic to humans. And then from there, that kind of morphed into right around May this year. I'm sorry. Yes. May this year of a full on 
that this has been the first time in my life that I've been able to stick to any type of eating 100% with no cheats, no no handfuls of stuff. For the longest time, I would try to do carnivore, but I'd have handfuls of blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, whatever. Not necessarily super bad foods, not like cheating with McDonald's hamburgers or something like that, but just having a handful of the berries or a couple bites of an apple. And that one bite, that one berry would just make my cravings they would, they would just overrun me. And I would go from eating one berry or just a little bit to the next day, I'd notice I'd have a bite of the kid's cereal. And then I'd be eating a whole bowl myself and just relapse into that worse off than I was originally eating just the keto diet, if you will. It's uh, those cravings would just come and come and come. And when I was one of those strategies that I worked with, Dr. Sean O'Mara, you've had him on the show. I hired him to help with that. And the fermented vegetables really kicked my cravings. And so now I don't have any cravings whatsoever. There, If there's cookies or donuts or anything at, at work or whatnot, it's almost like I see them, but I just have no interest in them. And I know that that's all inside of my gut and my head, but that it, that's I think that's a, a pretty good deal that I can just stick to my diet now. That's It's 99% meat. The amount of vegetables that I eat, it's, I don't know, if you were to take, it's probably about I don't know, maybe an ounce per meal type that like sauerkraut and kimchi. Other than that, though, it's just all mainly beef for me. You said symptoms have gotten better since you've adopted mm-hmm. this pretty much all meat with a few fermented vegetables diet. The issue with the MS, you had a period of diplopia, double vision, optic neuritis, numbness from your legs, down, waist down for a while. What other symptoms were you getting that were indicative of, of MS? Was that did you have any like ongoing symptoms that occurred? So over the years, I had, I've had i had a handful of them. I'll go through the major ones, but there were always was little things like I would feel twitchy in, in, in a finger here or my toe would be a little bit numb there for a few days. I don't know for a fact that's all related, but it seems to all align with that. In addition to all of just the little uh, aches and pains, if you will, uh, the main things that I had are the migraine headaches. Uh, I had arthritis in my joints. Um, my wrists, my neck, my elbows, my knees, my ankles, everything just kind of was always just a little bit achy. Uh, and I felt like I was, I'm, I'm relatively young still, I'm 39 now, but um, I just felt maybe this is just getting old. You know, when I'm 35, a lot of other people, uh, a lot of my friends are, they're doing way worse than me. So who am I to complain? Um, I had the dermatitis uh, on my scalp. I had uh, chronic diarrhea that was happening about three to four times a week. I had really bad canker sores. I don't know if they're directly related to the MS, but they definitely were related to what was going on in my gut. And the biggest symptoms that I had were the fatigue and the brain fog. And those are pretty, those go hand in hand with MS. A lot of people with MS uh, experience those and it's the, you can differentiate between the brain fog and the fatigue. To me, the brain fog is when I'm feeling relatively well, but I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to read a book. I'm trying to work on something for work and I just can't focus. It's not that I'm distracted. I just can't focus on it. So I'm staring at a sentence in the book and you can't even read through a full sentence before you're forgetting what you had just read a few words earlier. I differentiate that from the fatigue to the fatigue was never a, a physical fatigue for me. It was more of like a mental exhaustion. So like I would be able to concentrate on stuff. However, I would wake up at four or five in the morning and just, I'm already wiped out. It, it felt like I had worked uh, 12 hours at work and had 20 meetings all day long. I was just wore out mentally all day long. And that would come and go and I noticed a little bit of difference depending how I ate, but I was never a hundred percent with how I ate then. But now the brain fog and the fatigue, they're just completely gone from, I I usually wake up between four and five, sometimes six in the morning, most days during the week. And it's, I just wake up just laser brained, ready to go. I can focus on something all day. I read, I can read several chapters in a book. I can just, I can sit there and do something for a couple hours and just be totally involved with it and not forget what I was doing. And that's the one of the biggest improvements that I'm, I've seen as far as the ailments that the MS has caused for myself. So 
I am pretty lucky that as far as like a physical disability, I haven't had a, any permanent disability uh, that I know of. And I do, that's another thing I guess I should mention is I have, I was diagnosed with the relapse and remitting kind. So you have an attack and then it clears up and then you uh, get back to baseline or you have just a little bit of disability. And then depending on how much disability you have, your neurologist will classify you a little bit different. But as of right now, I don't have any permanent physical disability. So mine was more no pun intended, but in my head with the brain fog and the uh, the fatigue, and those have completely gone away. I'm I'm super excited about those. Those are the most exciting because the quality of life is just much better uh, throughout the day. You don't just constantly feel like you're in a cloud and in a funk or a fog or anything. Yeah, I was going to ask you what subtype you're because there's, there's a primary progressive and relapsing remitting and, and a few other subtypes. Did they talk to you about medication treatments? There's a few anti-inflammatories, you know, with stero- corticosteroids, and then immune modulating or immunosuppressive drugs are often given for MS. Were any of those offered to you or did you have had, do any of those for a period of time? So, yes, the ones that all... All of the neurologists that I were working with, they all recommended the B cell depleter ones. Essentially, it's a blood infusion that you go take and it suppresses your immune system. It just cuts it down a little bit. So it quits attacking your own, your body's own cells, the the myelin and whatnot that's around your nerves. And they recommended that, that, that was a little bit scary to hear that, that they wanted to suppress my immune system because I do, I talked to them and they said, yeah, you're going to, if you do this, absolutely, there's a chance that it will help with your MS. And there's a chance that it will prevent any permanent disability years down the road. That's the way that the the drugs are designed for MS. They're not designed to fix you right now. They're designed to hopefully make it where you don't have issues down years down in the future, whatever years that may be one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. That was a, the B cell depleter was the one that they all said. and, And I didn't really like the idea of my immune system being suppressed And because of everything that I had already been researching and learning about the immune system, just to try to fix my other stuff, I figured that I was lucky enough at the time to not have any permanent disability. And the one neurologist that I still have, he agreed that if I wanted to try something else, we could fall back on the medications in the future. If I had an attack, I have a cell phone number, he'll call in and they'll put me on the, the steroids just to acutely get rid of the inflammation right then and try to save me from having any disability. And then we would talk about the the lifelong or the prolonged drugs after that, the immune suppressant drugs. So since it wasn't an extreme case, I told him I wanted to try to figure it out myself j- just on my own. And he agreed that he had heard about people trying to do that on their own with MS, as well as people that were on medications where they weren't doing so great with the medications. And then they introduced carnivore and that helped them with their symptoms. It just made stuff better for them. So for for one, I, I didn't like the idea to suppress my immune system because I felt like it would never give me the chance to figure out what underlying issue is actually causing everything to flare up in the first place. And that's my goal is to figure out that because the MS isn't the only, I don't like to say that my MS is causing all of these other things. I think I have all these other things and all of those combined, they're symptomatic of the MS. And then the, with the radiographic images of my brain, I can actually see it. So I think that if I can fix all my other autoimmune stuff and get better from those, the, my MS will uh, continue to improve. And since then we have seen improvements. I had initial scans and follow-up scans showing the the degradation of the tissue the in, in the brain the spots and the spinal cord going away there I don't have any more spots now I did back in November and then I believe in July is when I got rescanned this year for my brain and spinal cord the it showed improvement it showed the spots were gone so I think that what I'm doing is working my neurologist mentioned that they usually don't see the spots go away I it's not completely like I'm not the only person out there that saw spots go away, but it's not the it's not the norm. Normally, your spots just stop and they're no longer active. They give you the contrast dye for the the with contrast MRI, and they'll see where there are existing spots, but they're just not leaking the contrast dye anymore. We did did all of that, but also noticed that where there was spots, there's no longer spots. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the the MRI findings because I've seen. I don't know if he's in here today, but this guy we have another fellow, Kevin, who's had 
I think a more severe version of MS, but he's also seeing a significant improvement in his uh, clinical outcome as well as his radiographic outcomes. He's, he's seen regression of his his plaques, the plaques that you get. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I was going to ask you with the rem- relapsing remitting kind, even still the the spots or the plaques stay there, but they don't progress. That's typically the norm. And yours have actually regressed to where you can't see them anymore, which is quite interesting. Mm-hmm. You mentioned you would have occasional symptoms prior when you had this diagnosis. How frequently were they occurring? And have you had any at all since you switched over to this more kind of purish carnivore diet? To make the short the story short, I can talk forever. The I would get usually I don't know if you can see it. Usually right in here, I would this finger would just start going like that. And that was one of them. My I would get that in my toe and my calf where the muscles just spasm up for a little bit. That would happen. It's hard to say because I, I never tracked that, but I would notice it probably a couple times a month, just the little things like that. And since doing this, I don't I don't remember the last time that I've had one of those as far as like just on a, a regular day-to-day basis that sometimes like after I work out or something like that, a lot of my mu- muscles will be twitching, but that's just normal. But for the little, I, I just call them my aches and pains, the little annoying things, those have gone away. I don't remember having any of those in the last couple of months. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to see. And so your neurologist, it's interesting that he's heard of other people doing carnivore and improvement. I think we're, it's, we're enough people are doing it now that we're starting to see that and that he's, you know, on board with you doing that. That's good. Do you find one of the, you'd mentioned that before on keto, you'd be subject to cravings and your kids are eating cereal. You know, it's, it's tough when you have kids in the house. I mean, we don't really have cereal in our house, so it makes it a little easier for me. But do you find that outside of obviously some of these, uh, brain fog and MS symptoms and psoriasis symptoms. Any other sort of, let, let me ask you about this. Any negative, have you noticed any negatives to the diet? Cause I think that's a fair question to ask. I try to ask that with most of the guests, if I can remember any major negatives that have been there that you've noticed. I don't know if you would call this a negative. I don't really see it as a negative. I see it more as a, I get to learn more about myself, but when I eat, like for example, yesterday I had Steaks were on sale. So I had two pounds of ribeye yesterday and then I wasn't hungry. And then this morning when I woke up, I know that I'm not hungry, but I know that I'm bored. So I feel like eating and that what I would eat would be a a hamburger or a steak, just the meat part. So it, once you're getting used to it, it, it opens the window for you to be with your thoughts and realize when you're like the difference between being hungry and being bored with being bored, something that you can experience in the middle of being busy. You don't have to have nothing to do to be bored. You can be at work and your stomach may grumble or something like that. And you realize that it's not that you're hungry, you're just bored. And that's that would be about the only negative. I've had a pretty good experience with it so far as as far as not being hungry, if you will. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, hopefully it, it makes sense to at least some people. No, it certainly does. I've, I've certainly seen a lot of people comment on that. But let's, let me go back to the, you said you have a small amount of these fermented vegetables, whether it be sauerkraut or kimchi or, or something. And even, I don't, I, I don't know if you're including fermented dairy right now, maybe not. Mm-hmm. Yes. But what do you feel has been the advantage to doing that rather than just saying just meat by itself? What has been the advantage for you in particular? So I think for me, I've always had a lot of gastro intestinal problems, mainly just diarrhea two, three, four times a month. My dad had it. I had it. The doctor said I probably got it from him. My regular general practitioner told me I probably got it from him. I haven't done research. The reason that I think that I have it and they say that I got it from him is because I grew up with him. So I ate the same as he did, had the same environment as he did. So as I got older, I was still eating the same things as he did. So naturally, I came to the conclusion that since my dad had it and I'm eating the same stuff, I have it. So with with the diarrhea going away, that's really been eye-opening that you, you change your diet and the things like that just can get better. What was the beginning of your question? I got off on a tangent of there. No, just the benefits of the fermented foods that you were, okay. that you were, you were, so you were saying. That, I see. Yeah, that's the reason. So because of the diarrhea, I figured that something was wrong inside of my gut, some type of dysbiosis. My balance was off with the bacteria, too much of the microbes that want to eat sugar and that were causing uh, my cravings and everything. So 
uh, part of one of the things that I did, one of my doctors, the other Dr. Sean, he had me uh, start eating some of the fermented vegetables uh, specifically to get the the more uh, diverse microbiome cooking in, in my inside of me, if you will. The thing that I noticed with that is number one, the cravings, it completely went away for me. That made it super easy to not have the cravings. And a funny thing happened with that, which I have to limit myself now. Now, the only craving that I have is like for more of those ferments. And I do have to watch it because I can very easily overdo it and put way too much on my plate for too many days in a row and cause myself, I'll get real bad bloating and gas if I do that. So I use that as a marker of when I've had too much, back off of that a little bit. And, and usually about an ounce, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on what it is and how long that I ferment it. I make them, I make most all of my own ferments in the house. Depending on the potency of them, if you will, it will determine how much of them I consume. And that is the, the purpose of that for me is to accelerate my gut healing so that once I get there and everything has, I just feel a hundred percent all the time. I'm assuming that day is going to come probably not. I don't know who knows six months a year. No, there's no telling, but eventually I'll just be feeling a hundred percent all of the time instead of 90% or, or whatever. And at that point, I'll reevaluate that and, and see uh, where I need to go from there to, for whatever the next uh, bit of progress that I'm looking for. When you mention uh, the attempt is to bring better gut diversity in theory, have you, have you been able to assess that some way? Have you done some sort of microbiome analysis or was it just, we think this is what works or is it just symptoms based on symptoms? Yeah. Uh, based off of symptoms, I haven't uh, been able to get a microbiome test yet. Uh, there's a couple of different labs out there and I'm, I'm trying to, to get a doctor to um, issue the orders. Nobody will just let me go online, swipe my credit card and get the test. There's always the couple of labs I've looked at need the orders, but for the symptoms, all the stuff that I've read and the symptoms that I have, that part of it, there is like a self-diagnosis thing. That's just kind of what I feel is messed up with my gut. It, the fact that I was able to go from having sugar cravings to not having sugar cravings, making dietary changes is what kind of led me down that road of thinking that if I fix whatever's wrong in my gut, the other things also will get better. Yeah, that's certainly, I'm a big sort of proponent of just symptoms as opposed to sometimes some of these labs can be hard to interpret, you know, know what they actually mean. There's a lot of context based behind those. Do you, obviously you're managing disease. Are you doing anything else besides a meat-based diet with some fermented foods? Are, are there sleep adjustments, exercise, any light light exposure. What is your, do you have an overall strategy? You said you looked in a lot of these things. So what are you doing? Oh uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll see, you, you might have to help me with some of those bullet points as I talk through it, but for the sleep, absolutely. My, my sleep is way better now with a focus and an emphasis on improving my sleep. I used to stay up till 10, 11, 12 at night, wake up at four or five in the morning, go work out and just bulldoze my way through the day just to try to get through it. And I just figured that was normal. Everybody's tired. I got a, a seven and eight year old uh, daughters. So I'm sure that they were wearing me out. And I just assumed that I did adjust my sleep schedule where now at 9pm, I'm going to bed. There's no if ands or buts about it. That's my self imposed bedtime. And then I wake up uh, usually between five o'clock and seven o'clock. It, it depends on what I have planned for that morning. Some days I read, or some days I write some days I work out, I hit my home gym in the garage four or five, six times a week. I used to work out a lot more, but as part of recovery and sleep, I, I laid off a little bit on that. I was doing CrossFit six to seven days a week for years. And that was, lo I love it. I love doing it. It's so much fun. And I enjoy just burning my lungs to death type thing. But I did lay back on that just a little bit. And that also helped with my recovery. And since then, it, the exercise in combination with the sleep has provided me with more recovery now too. So I'm able to, to do the harder workouts, the days that I work out, and then I'll have a better recovery. And I won't, I don't walk around feeling just completely broken and sore all the time. Like I used to with regards to light, the, I do get outside early in the morning as much as possible. And I spent, I try to spend as much time in the sun as possible. I live in Florida right now. It's you'd laugh at me, but I'm wearing a sweater because it's about 53 degrees outside. And that is ice cold here in Florida. So 
I still try to get outside. I try to start my morning with the with getting the light in my eyes and on my skin, the natural light. And then I try to also in the evening time, get the light on me as much as possible outside, just go outside, wear gym clothes, whatever, no shirt. And yesterday, my workout, I pulled my pull up rack squat bar thing out in the uh, driveway and did, did my workout out there in the driveway in the sun yesterday, mid morning. That was nice. During the summertime, it's a lot easier just because of the angle of the sun and the time. Because right now I'm at, at work by seven o'clock. And then when I get home at about 5.30, it's almost completely dark outside this time of year. So that's a little bit more difficult. I try to go for walks during the middle of the day just to get the extra light. And then also one of the things that I do notice, I know that some people don't notice a difference and some people do, but I do wear the these like blue light blocking glasses at night. So right around seven o'clock, Right after dinner, I usually throw those on for whatever I'm doing, whether it be reading or not, because there's still regular lights from the house that that come through. And I can tell a difference when I wear those glasses and when I don't wear those glasses. The main difference being how fast I fall asleep. I'll, to I'll toss and turn for an hour sometimes if I don't wear them. And where when I do wear them, I just I, I fall right to sleep. And it's, I don't know if it's placebo effect or not, but whatever it is, it certainly, those dang glasses, they work for me. So I try to avoid the artificial lights at night. I don't remember the other point. Yeah, there's, I've noticed and I haven't used them in quite a while, but I remember when I would wear those glasses, I feel like I would sleep a lot easier in some cases. So I think there is something to that. I mean, there's a lot of data that supports that quite honestly. It's just a matter of being, I guess, disciplined enough to do that. How does the rest of the family react to your sort of oddball? Because most people consider it's an odd diet, it's, to be fair, most people... 99% of the people out there don't eat a carnivore diet, although that number is changing. We're seeing more and more people mm -hmm. do that. How does your family react to that? Obviously, your kids aren't eating that, but a wife, what's the household sort of thing like? So at first, when I started doing it, of course, part of my family, they thought I was crazy. They thought I was going to kill myself. Oh my gosh, you have to have and insert dot, 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 every single thing that everybody hears on the internet, everything that their general doctor tells them, you need your fiber, you need your your vitamin C and your cholesterol is going to be through the roof and you're going to, you're going to die by the time you're 40. I turn 40 next year. So I'm still here. The interesting thing is after I just talk and talk and talk and talk about it, I send people videos, articles, discussions from all different hosts of people on the internet. And they've started to notice and that I'm improving not only like the MS stuff aside, but everything else in the gym, I'm stronger in the gym. I'm faster in the gym. I feel like I'm smarter now. Certainly I have, I can get through my day. That's going to be a lack of the fatigue and the brain fog, but I'm um, cognitively lot wise. I'm a lot sharper. So that's really great. And then, but so they used to think that Wayne has this crazy diet. Let's talk about something else. I often make the joke, but it's not a joke that they'd rather talk about politics and religion than diet with me at family gatherings. Cause they know where I'm headed with it. And over time, they everybody's came around and understanding what I'm trying to do, the information that I've learned and what I'm trying to solve for. I'm trying to solve for inflammation essentially overall in my body. So get everything out that shouldn't be there and just try to get back to a baseline. And since then, there's a few people in my family that have started to eat a meat heavy diet. My wife, she picked up on it. And since I do, since I've always done all of the cooking in our house, I slowly started to transition away from the macaroni and cheese and the pasta and the casseroles. And she would never eat beef at all. She would eat just a little bit of fish and chicken, but she never liked beef. And then over the months, now she pretty much eats like I do, just beef. She'll eat steak, albeit she makes me cook it well done and it kills me to do that. But she'll eat well done steak or hamburgers with some of the ferments that I do. And she still eats her other things too here and there. We have some Christmas cookies out on the counter right now that, that her and the kids nibble on. And the the kids actually, surprising, th this might sound funny, but or not funny, but different. We have seven and eight-year-old girls and oftentimes their dinner, they'll eat, each eat a half pound hamburger with me. So that's a seven and eight-year-old kid. And that's just, they'll eat the meat patty and then usually we'll give them some fruit on their plate to go along with that. And they seem to be happy with it. Every now and again, they want they want the normal stuff that they want. They want pizza. And, and so 
sometimes we give into that, but for the most part, they eat like I do at home and then they get other things at school and grandparents' house. But overall, I would say my family is there. It started off a little bit rough with thinking that this was the terrible thing for me to do to myself. And lately it's been more of they understand it and they can see what I'm trying to do and they're seeing some results. So there's less of those awkward conversations and there's more, it's transitioning more into they have questions now. Hey, what do you think about this? Or what do you think this does for you? Or what improvements have you seen? Or a lot of times I'll get, oh, you look, you look healthier. You don't look like you're aging as much as some of my other family members. So it's pretty interesting to say the least. Yeah, it's it, you know, what you said about your wife. My mine is almost exactly the same way. She was a literally a vegetarian, just finished being a vegetarian when I met her, and and now she's over about a five year period. I got her, I convinced her to eat red meat, and now she now that's all she wants to eat. But she's the same way. She wants it oh, yeah. much, which pains me, particularly when I'm cooking nice steaks to have to do that. I'm just like, you know, this is <laughs> old- there's any pink at all. She's like, I can't eat it, and I'm like. It tastes better. It literally is. It literally tastes better. <laughs> it, it takes twice as three times as long to cook. It does take a long time because I, I, I can't. Hers I, on ten know, minutes on the grill before mine hits the grill. Yeah, I, I do the same thing. <laughs> I, I found one thing I found with steaks was quite helpful. Is I'll sous vide a lot of steaks, mm-hmm. and I end up getting two sous vides because I would I would put hers at one sixty and then mine at one twenty or whatever it was, mm-hmm. and just let them go. And then I'd sear them at the same time. And that, that helped for, because it is a pain when restaurants have to do this and they, they're able to time it a little better because they have more facilities. But when you're trying to feed everybody at the same time, you're like, okay, let me start your, you, you figure it out. Okay. I'll put your stuff out there 10 minutes before everybody else's and hopefully it'll be mm-hmm. going. So you adapt to it, but anyway, it's a science. It, it is becomes a science. And are you say we mentioned about cooking. Do you have a preferred technique? Are you getting pretty good at cooking up steaks and stuff like that at this point? Oh, man, you should come over. I'll cook for you. The, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know that I have a favorite way to cook them. One of the most consistent way, the first way I started cooking them was in a sous vide. The same guy that told me about keto told me about sous vide years and years later. And we went into that and send a thousand pictures back and forth. You just sous vide it. Mine, I like to do 131 degrees for two hours and then sear it. However, you're going to sear it. I got a blowtorch. I got a propane gas grill thing like the restaurants have you shove it in there and the flame comes down from the top i think that's what you use that Mm -hmm. i don't know what brand it is but i got one of those and then i also like to do it in the the cast iron sometimes and then if i'm feeling lazy i'll literally throw it in the oven under the broiler and smoke the house up just because i don't feel Mm -hmm. like going outside but i like to do that i like to cook on my i got a propane grill i don't have a charcoal grill just because if i had to use charcoal every single day there'd be a lot of waste so it's logistically, it's a little bit difficult, but I use the heck out of my propane grill. I use it probably six to seven times a week. I use it every week. I'll be cooking on it here when we're done here in a bit. But no, mine are I pull them out of the fridge, throw some salt on them, high full blast heat. It gets up to about 600 degrees in about 10 minutes or so, three minutes on each side, check it with a ther- thermometer. And then once it hits 125 internal temp on the grill, I pull it off and let it rest for a few minutes and then I eat it. And then for my burgers, I do the exact same thing. I like to thick patty up burgers. I usually I'll do anywhere between eight ounces and the full package. I'll do a full one pound hamburger. Mm -hmm. Same thing, salt, throw it on the grill, three minutes each side, flip it over a few times, check it just to make sure that internal temp hits 125 or yeah, 125 degrees. I eat my ground beef medium rare and same thing. Just, I just eat it like that and a big old one pound hamburger and Man, that's in heaven. And, and I do have to say, if it comes down to steak versus hamburger, I'm going to have to vote for hamburger. Just j- it, there's something about it. Just all those little ground up bits. I don't know what it is. It's just the flavor of it is good. Mainly I eat mostly hamburger. And then I have probably have steaks once or twice a week. They're on sale right now at our local grocery store for, I don't know, nine ninety or eight, six, something super cheap, half price, if you will, through the end of the year. I bought a couple of the big old primal cuts and I'll Vac seal them and freeze them and keep them for steaks in the future. Yeah, that's an interesting debate because hamburgers is consistently good. You know, mm-hmm. generally steak, it depends on the type of steak. There's a lot of variables that go into steak that can make it very good. I think the ability to be really good on the steak is higher than hamburger, but it's also the ability is to be a little lower. And mm-hmm. hamburger is consistently pretty high quality and pretty good. So, I, and I've been eating recently, I've been eating a lot more hamburger. Bob, I'm throwing an egg and some cheese on there. And so giving a little bit more, mm-hmm. a little bit more. I eat a lot yeah. of eggs too more of that stuff there. All right. We've got a couple more minutes left. Are you 
sharing any of this stuff on social media or anything like that? Is that something you've opted to do or are you, you keeping it, uh, keeping yeah, it to so yourself? Absolutely. Feel free to share this with anybody. I don't really have a social media presence right now. I'm working on that. If you're asking if somebody wants to reach out to me, the best way to get a hold of me right now is my email address. My ex account doesn't, I haven't really done any posts other than two or three pictures of my dinners or something like that. But in the future, I'll be bringing, bringing my story and everything to social media. And so do you want to share your email or your ex account or, or is that? Oh, sure. Uh, my email address is, I spell it out usually, but it's a uh, W-B-L-A-C-K-S-H at gmail.com. And that's the best way to get a hold of me for right now. Okay. And your ex account, you? It's the same thing. It's just, I think it's at W-B-L-A-C-K-S-H. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Anything else we missed that you want to share in these last few minutes? I'm looking at my notes on my other screen. No, I think that's pretty much it. I think I think that once I solve for, so the last thing that I have is the migraine headaches. One of my goals is to get off of having to take the acetaminophen, the Excedrin, taking, I used to have to take, this is interesting. I used to have to take a thousand milligrams of that, the super strong stuff. And I'd have to take that over the course of a few days to knock one of those headaches out. Now, when I get a headache, sometimes they'll go away by themselves. And sometimes I can get away with taking a much lesser dose of that. I do know from the standpoint of my migraines that what I'm doing is got me headed in the right direction. I am looking forward to the day that I no longer get headaches. And I think that that's coming. I'm just going to stay consistent and stay on track. And hopefully, hopefully that gets me set straight with those. Very good. All right. Thank you, Wayne, for sharing that. Again, it's, it just, it's, I, I just see more and more of these examples and Yet another one with MS this time. And and so great for you to share that. I, I hope you get this out there because this information needs to be out there for people to try. Not that it's going to work for everybody, but at least some people will be willing to try this. And thank mm -hmm. you for doing that. So anyway, thanks so much, Wayne. Appreciate it. All right. It. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good one.